welcome to the Andy Social Podcast, episode 188, with senior concept artist at Weta Workshop in Wellington, Nick Keller. Great chat. Looking forward to sharing that with you all. But before we kick into it, if you are brand new to the podcast, how you doing? My name is Andy Dowling, and I host this show, funnily enough. But I also play bass in the Australian metal band Lord. And if you love a bit of old school heavy metal uh, in the vein of Maiden, Judas Priest, Halloween, Queensryche, um, maybe some newer stuff like Symphony X, um, you know, Nevermore a little bit. Oh, like, we've got a few little Nevermore-ish riffs here and there. Anyway, go and check out our band Lord over at lord.net.au. We've got a brand new album coming out the 1st of August called Fallen Idols, and you can pre-order that right now by going to lord.net.au slash fi. And there you can find the Australian track listing for the album, um, which is what is available for pre-order. Um, and there are three pre-order options to secure your copy of the album. Uh, the first option is the CD on its own. Um, and you can elect to get it signed by us if you wish. Uh, the second option is the CD and T-shirt together. And the third option is a deluxe bundle pack, which is the CD, the T-shirt, three patches, including a back patch um, and a additional bonus CD, which is karaoke versions of the entire album, plus some additional bonus tracks as well. And it's limited to a hundred copies. So uh, if you want to support the band, you're trying to work out which one to pick, definitely pick the deluxe one. That's a, the biggest help for us, but um, nice little bundle pack there, lots of goodies. And I'm really, really happy with the support you guys have given so far with pre-ordering this album. If you're coming to any of the shows on this tour and you want to collect your CD in advance, that's right, folks, you can get your CD before release date. Let us know in advance and show proof of purchase. And I will make sure that we hand you over a copy of the album on the night. Um, at the time of this episode coming out, I believe tomorrow is our Melbourne date, which is the 5th of July at the Evelyn Hotel in Melbourne, a part of the Forge Heavy Metal Nightclub, which, which we're headlining. And the uh, 6th of July, Saturday, is in Adelaide at Jive Nightclub. And then the 26th of July uh, at Crowbar in Sydney. Had to think about that one. Uh, for the first ever edition of the Forge Heavy Metal Nightclub in Sydney. So if you're in Sydney and you're a metal fan, please get out and support that. We definitely need it in Sydney. So uh, a big night awaits. Um, and thank you so much to everybody that's uh, come to the shows to date in Canberra, Brisbane and Perth. I've got no idea how they actually went because I'm recording this episode in advance, but I'm assuming that they were fantastic. And, I'm, and at the time of recording this, I'm like absolutely pumped to um, get out there and play again. So um, thank you so much to everybody that did come out to those shows and hopefully uh, pick up some merch and got your copies of the album and hopefully hopefully you're enjoying them. And to everybody else, please uh, consider pre-ordering the new album. Oh, and before, I know I'm crapping on too much folks, but before um, I wrap this section up, uh, the pre-order, this is the Australian edition of the album. And once this first pressing is sold out, uh, more than likely we will repress, but without the bonus tracks, there'll be more of a global version of the album which will be uh, the 10 tracks or maybe 10 tracks plus one bonus track instead of three. So if you want a copy of this particular album, and by the way, these bonus tracks will not be on Spotify or Apple Music or anything like that. Um, it'll just be the standard 10 tracks that are on all those streaming platforms. So if you want the bonus tracks, you either have to buy the digital downloads from Bandcamp or buy the CD uh, from Bandcamp as well. So anyway, go to lord.net.au slash fi. It's all there self-explanatory, but if you've got any questions, let me know. Now, in addition to being a heavy metal warrior and hosting this podcast, I also host a second podcast because one is clearly not enough. The second one is called Self Starter, and it's all about small business, self-employment, and freelancing. So depending on uh, what you're interested in, and maybe you want to start your own business, maybe you've already got one, maybe you're in the world of freelancing, whatever it is, uh, Self Starter could be for you. So you can go to selfstarter.com.au. You can search for Self Starter in your podcast player. Um, season two kicked off in June of this year, and we're a couple of episodes in already. And uh, so far, the um, well, probably three episodes in, I think, by now. Um, and the reaction so far has been fantastic. It's been really, really good and just really appreciative of all the support that uh, you guys have been giving me and getting behind this podcast. If you know anybody out there that needs a little kick up the ass or a little dose of inspiration or some reassurance, because being self-employed is a little bit daunting and scary at times, but it is extremely rewarding. So please go over to selfstarter.com.au. Go and check all that stuff out and uh, I'd love to hear what you think. 
Shout out time. Every week, I thank some champion, some legend who supports a podcast and can be a range of different ways. It could be messages of encouragement, guest recommendations. It could be buying some merch from the online store, some merch, a t-shirt, a patch. Um, I've got the USB pass, which is the first 100 episodes of the of the podcast in a nice little uh, wallet size USB pass. Heaps of stuff. Um, it could be uh, shouting me a beer via the PayPal button over at antisocial.net. It doesn't matter. It all helps. It's a massive help for me and the podcast. And uh, I just really appreciate all the little 1% extras that people do for me. So thank you so much to everybody. But every week I thank one person, put them on public record. And it's just my way of just saying thanks, giving back a little bit. So this week's shout out is for Pat Covey. Covey or Covey? Covey. Let's just say Covey. From Wakefield in Massachusetts, I believe. I wrote MA. I'm pretty sure MA is Massachusetts in the US. And uh, Pat's getting a shout out because he gave me a beer shout. So thank you so much, Pat. Uh, Slung me a couple of dollars and my whole thing behind the beer shout is that the more that you guys shout me beers, it's the less of my personal money that I spend on alcohol, which means that my personal money can be spent on the podcast. So a very roundabout way of supporting the podcast and my love of alcohol. So <laughs> it's probably not the best uh, pitch, but anyway, uh, thank you so much, Pat. Really appreciate it. Uh, when you hear this, please shoot me a message and I will be more than happy to send you out a nice little thank you pack or thank you gift or something lying around my house. I'm going to bundle together a couple of little things and send them out to you because we all like getting something in the mail. So thank you so much, Pat. And once again, thank you so much to everybody that continues to show their appreciation and their support for this podcast. It means a hell of a lot. In addition to all of that, I also have a page, a portal that's set up for all the shit that I sell. If you go to andysocial.net slash buy stuff, there you will find links to everything that I sell. I'm a salesman. I've got the band stuff there, Dominus Records. I've got the eBay store, um, and I've also got Discogs there as well. So uh, with eBay and Discogs, eBay, Jess and I, my wife Jess and I, we just sell a whole heap of crap that's been lying around the house. We love the whole decluttering thing and uh, lots of stuff on there, clothes, uh, music memorabilia, um, Un- unwanted gifts. Sorry, folks, for anybody who's been giving us gifts over the years, please don't look on eBay. Uh, they might be on there. Um, just heaps of stuff on there. So if you're looking for something random, uh, maybe you're looking for somebody uh, a gift for somebody else, or maybe you're looking for, I don't know, some clothes or, or music stuff, whatever, go over there, andysocial.net slash buy stuff. Um, the eBay store link is there. And also Discogs has uh, over 1,500 uh, CDs, vinyl, cassettes, DVDs, um, just all music, rock, metal, punk, blues, pop, jazz, everything. There's heaps of stuff there. Um, lots of great stuff. I just came back from Japan not too long ago and brought back a bucket load of metal, um, that you can find on Discogs as well. So lots of cool stuff there, especially if you're looking for something in particular, um, go and check all that out. So antisocial.net slash buy stuff and a few little shout outs for people that support me via all these little platforms. Uh, we got Michael from Chicago and Illinois in the U S of a Roger from Marrickville in New South Wales, Jason from North Sydney in New South Wales, Carsten from Frederica, Frederica, Frederica in Denmark. <laughs> My pronunciation sucks guys. Nicholas from Strasbourg in France, uh, Dietmar in Camp Lintfort in Germany, and Daniel from Singleton Heights in New South Wales. Thank you so much, folks. Really appreciate the support. Go and check it all out over at antisocial.net slash buy stuff. Episode 188 of the podcast this week is with senior concept artist at Weta Workshop, Nick Keller. Nick is a freaking freak when it comes to art. I don't even know how to describe half of the stuff that he does, but um, he does amazing stuff. If you just talk about Weta Workshop on its own, which in this chat, I don't think I dug in deep enough into that world. Um, he is just this incredibly talented guy. Um, he works with a whole bunch of different uh production company. Well, I guess they're sort of a production company. Anyway, he works with so many different uh, films and creates all this concept art. And it's just absolutely incredible, the sort of work that he's been doing over, over the years. And, um, I mean, he's worked with some of the, um, films such as Avatar, um, Under the Mountain, The Chronicles of Narnia, Indiana Jones 4, The Hobbit trilogies, heaps and heaps of stuff. But where I discovered Nick's work was from the old school heavy metal album art covers. Uh, Nick's done some fantastic art for some amazing bands, especially in the extreme metal world. Um, He's been doing bands such as Disentombed from uh, Brisbane, 
um, Fallujah, Beast Wars, The Black Dahlia Murder, Bullet Bell, Dawn of Azazel, which was Rigel Walsh, who's been on the podcast previously. I can't even remember what episode that was, 20-something, maybe, back in the day. Um, he is just, oh, and In Malice's Wake, of course. Um, so Sean Fallujah from In Malice's Wake, who was episode 171 of the podcast. Um, Nick did one of their covers as well. And it is just incredible, like absolutely incredible artwork. I, I can't even... I'm not even understating it. It's you, you need to check it out. And I'm going to put stuff in the show notes over at andysocial.net. Of course, you can go and check all, all of his artwork out. Um, he's just, I, I can't even wrap my head around how somebody can create this stuff. Um, I, as anybody that's been listening to this podcast or knows me, um, knows that I'm this person that keeps crapping on about how I wish I could draw or wish I could, uh, you know, design stuff or be an artist or all this sort of stuff. And basically I just never get started. So that's half the battle. Um, but I just, I'm in awe of people that have this kind of talent and Nick is just up there, like one of the best out there. So I know I'm gushing at the moment, but I really am a big, big fan of what he does. So if you want to go and check out his stuff, you can go to nickkellerart.com. Um, he's on all the socials as well. So I'll put everything in the show notes over at andysocial.net, or you should be able to click through on your podcast player and there'll be a bunch of clickable links in there as well. But, um, great chat, great guy. Um, I found out that there was a, fa there was far more in common with him than I initially in expected. And, um, it was just a really, really fun chat and, uh, just great to hear where his mind's at or wh where he comes from, especially when it comes to this incredible incredible art. Okay, enough crapping on from me, folks. Sorry, guys. Gushing here. Bit of a man crush already. <laughs> Please enjoy this great chat with Nick Keller. I started off actually with uh, with the album cover stuff. Uh, I guess the heavy metal stuff with um, a local Wellington band called Beast Wars, um, who I, I, knew, I knew a couple of the guys and um, my wife, um, my then girlfriend at the time was uh, working with NATO, the drummer, and uh, I just voiced offhand that, oh man, we we kind of cool to to do an album cover for a band, you know, it's sort of thinking about a lot of that stuff from the seventies and eighties, and um, you know, it was all hand painted, and I just it was just sort of an offhand comment, and uh, and she obviously mentioned it to him, and he, I think you know, he was familiar with some of my my personal paintings, and and, and just kicked off from there. Um, so yeah, I think that that uh, that album came out, and some other local bands saw my work, um, and yeah, then it sort of went international. But it, it's sort of a side gig from my film work, so it's um, I, ju I just sort of take on the jobs as I can. Yeah, sort of moonlighting doing the album covers. I mean the the album covers obviously have caught my attention just from you know mutual friends that we both know that have released albums over the last few years and um you know distant tomb uh just recently um you've put out the new art for their new album as well and that's the second one that you've done with them and it's um obviously that's captured my attention but then i started digging in deeper and i thought oh shit man like this guy's done this guy's doing a fair bit of stuff here and i mean for me like I, I always crap on to people saying that I've got the attention span of a goldfish. Like I can't just stay on one thing for too long. I'm darting all over things. I very, very rarely sort of finish a project. I start stuff and then leave it go. And I look at this art that you're doing and just looking at your website and all this other stuff that you, that you've been working on over the years. And I just think, man, like not only having to find the time to be able to do all this stuff and have your side hustles and everything with the bands and obviously your film work, but you know, each of these pieces, no doubt, would take up a lot of time. I mean, what on average are you looking at to do some of this oil painting work? I mean, what sort of average are you looking at from a time invested? Um, well, I think I, I'm not very good at documenting that stuff. Um, I did, I've done a couple of time lapses in the past, which have, uh, you know, just sort of taking a photo a minute and then comping it all together. But um, that's the only real gauge I've had because it's sort of, you know, you do chip away at these things when you have a, you know, a spare hour or two hours, um, ideally a full day, but you know, it's, um, it's, it's pretty hard to, to carve out that time. Um, I think the last one I did for, uh, Beast Wars, their fourth album cover that the painting itself, I think was about 60 hours. Mm. And then there's all the time developing that as well. Cause, um, that one, I actually did a bit of digital sculpting, um, and, you know, spend a bit of time developing it so the end product's going to be better. It's, um, I mean, 
if even if you had like that time just in a block to be able to just dedicate like a few days in that week to, to smash it out i mean that's it's still a massive task to be able to take on, at least from my point of view, just given <laughs> given my attention span. But um, it's, I mean, for you, obviously, it comes with the territory now. You've been doing it for a few years, but um, you know, to to see the level of detail in some of this stuff is is quite quite incredible. And I think one of the things, you know, from me being a musician and sort of looking at other pieces of art out there when it comes to you know, especially the metal world, you know, for the last sort of twenty years, up until recently, in the last few years has been a lot of that really shocking CGI digital art. And it's been almost at one point when CD started to come out, become sort of less exciting. And before vinyl got the resurgence, people were not taking artwork very seriously. And so you had these sort of dialed in crappy, you know, CGI co copy and paste sort of album artwork uh, sort of covers. And it's just incredible to see, obviously, this change that's happened just recently with a lot of artists jumping on the bandwagon and really investing a lot of time and money into having art like this. Um, you know, I would assume that's probably what sort of sparked a lot of the interest that's come your way from other bands just saying, wow, like you guys are doing this. I need to find out who that is and, and try and do the same thing myself. Yeah, um, I guess so. It's, um, I've always, I've always liked doing traditional art. I always, and I think people do, um, like you say, people do gravitate towards that. Like um, something quite, quite tactile, and, and they can see the, you know, the artist's hands being, you know, is actually it's visible, it's there. Um, and you know, like all my work for the film industry, it's all um, it's predominantly film work. Um, but that all has, you know, a real quick turnaround, and it is it is all digital. You know, it's all Photoshop and three D software and stuff, and even in that realm, I try and hand paint as much stuff as I can, but um, certainly, you know, you, you want to get, you know, got to pump stuff out in multiple versions and it does, you know, sometimes you are using a lot of, you know, photography and just bashing it together. Um, so in a way it's, yeah, this is kind of therapeutic for me. Um, it, it, it's sort of, yeah, it, and it's quite different, you know, the, the concept art for film, that's one thing. It's kind of, you know, you're problem solving what you're, what you're putting down, what you're presenting to, you know, art directors and VFX supervisors and directors. It's not the end product. It's um, it's just a vehicle for them to get to the end product. Um, whereas, obviously, like the album covers, that's um, that's the finished piece. That's the final product. So it's quite a, you know, a lot of the conceptualising stuff is the same workflow, but um, you know, you're just you're just dialing it right in and. And obviously, doing it traditionally has that, that added appeal to me. Anyway, that must be hard. Um, you know, obviously, it's your profession and it's the, your, your professional career as far as you know doing all this work for film. But to be sort of, I guess, more or less a device in the grand scheme of things, where you're providing sort of this concept that can then be changed or extended on and going into film. I guess, as you said, like doing the album artwork, it's it's your creation and you're sort of influencing that final product. There's nothing in between, but I guess with the film stuff, that at some stage I would assume, or it still is, would be challenging at times, like just to put like you, yourself into it and then pass it on to somebody else and not really, I guess the end product will be different to what you've conceptualized. Yeah, I mean, the the film stuff, it definitely, you know, you're a, a cog and a, and a big machine obviously, but it's, for me, you know, and my experience has been, um, it's been pretty cool from the, the point of view that, you know, you, you're adding your piece, other, everyone else is adding their little piece and the kind of finished products is kind of more, it's more than the sum of the parts, if that makes sense. Mm. Um, so, so I, you know, that, that sort of collaboration, I, I really enjoy that. Um, but yeah, I mean, the constant, you know, endless iterations of things and it kind of, you feel like you do lose, um, creative control of stuff quite often, but, you know, you just got to put yourself in the space of like, look, this is not my, you know, I'm, I'm not the one at the helm of this. I'm just a, you know, I'm just a hand for hire. So it's, um, yeah, it's a, a lot of it does come down to your headspace and, you know, how you, how you frame stuff. Um, there's a lot of enjoyment to be had in that. Um, and I, I guess with the painting, it's, it's really, I mean, I kind of shot myself in the foot in a lot of ways, I think, to this album art in terms of how long it takes to produce stuff. Um, 
not just from the fact that it, it is sort of an after hours sort of thing, but you know, I've I've kind of got recognised for a lot of my pieces of these big wraparound gatefolds, which um, nice. you know, it's kind of like, oh, okay, now I have to kind of produce, you know, double, you know, two compositions and but also form one composition. Yeah. So, I mean, I know there's a, there's a lot of people out there as well uh, in this, um, you know, in the illustration world, you know, beyond just album art, doing beautiful digital art that has a real, um, you know, a real traditional feel to it um, which I just just I guess comes with time uh, that stuff you were referencing earlier about the kind of you know that um, quite smashed together photo montage type artwork but yeah I, I, don't, I don't think people have a lot of patience for that it's, um, it, it doesn't it just doesn't have any heart or or feel to it it's definitely it's it's changed quite a bit and I think as people have started to take um take the art a bit more seriously again. I think, you know, your average sort of listener of music and metal's been a bit different. Um, I think metal's always had that sort of, that real sort of passionate sort of music enthusiast sort of demographic there that's ready to sort of take on the whole experience, not just the the audio, it's the entire sort of package experience. That's why CDs still seem to be doing okay and vinyl's obviously a big thing. But um, I think I think metal and, and rock certainly felt the the sting of sort of the early 2000s when everyone was sort of working out what's the future of music and, and all these artists sort of, well, at least from my perspective, got neglected. And, and I think a lot of people just automatically thought initially that, well, art's not important anymore because nobody's buying anything. So, you know, we'll just download stuff and, and just release music. So, oh, we have to have it cover. Okay. Well, let's just dial something in at the last minute before release, you know? So a lot of, a lot of really questionable covers, you know, around the, that turning point. But, um, I mean, I've, I've just noticed that maybe I'm just a little bit more in tune with it, um, more recently, but you know, I've, I've flicked through sort of some, uh, I've, uh, my brother's, um, a bit of an illustrator himself and I in, uh, inherited all these, um, uh, sort of illustration magazines. I can't remember what they're called, but um, I've got no idea when it comes to any form of art or illustration. And I'm looking at this stuff. And as you said before, there's a lot of people out outside of the music industry that are heavy, heavily into so this illustration world. And I was blown away. I couldn't believe what was out there and what people were doing. And it just seems that there seems to be more people out there that are really embracing this more detailed, uh, very traditional um you know, level of uh, uh, complexity that comes to comes to art and it seems that people are just taking it more seriously than ever. So it's just, and to see your work, is just exciting to see that bands are embracing it and just understanding the, the true value of having a piece that sort of represents what that album's going to be all about. Yeah, for sure. And for me, it's, um, which I hadn't really, you know, it, it took a little while to digest it, but I felt... You know, it was a really interesting thing to create a piece of visual art, and then it become kind of synonymous with, you know, this this audio, um, and vice versa. You know, it's kind of bringing a bringing an audience to the the visual art as well as, um, you know, yeah, a, a really interesting two way street there of, um, you know, crossing over these these two different art forms. Have you found that? with some of these guys that have come back and you've done multiple covers for like Beast Wars being one example and Disentomb now with their, their second, second album there uh, with, with your art. Um, do you find that the bands are sort of communicating with you in a way where their music and what they've been creating in between albums is somewhat influenced by what your art looks like? Like is your art sort of, I mean, and I say this in a very modest way. I don't want you to have to feel that you're talking yourself up. But do you, do you get any sort of feedback from some of the artists that maybe your artwork is is influencing their direction or what they're singing or you know writing about? Yeah, I've definitely had that experience. It's um, which is really cool. It's um, you know definitely those early stages where you know sometimes fans will approach me before they've gone into the studio or before the songs are formulated and. They might, you know, they'll have some ideas or, or they'll, you know, even just some rough mixes um, of some songs. It's, it, it, I think, um, I've definitely experienced it feeding both ways. So, you know, sometimes I have don't have any music to go on, um, but in other times bands will provide me with, yeah, here's a, here's a rough mix of the whole album. So I can kind of get a, you know, formulate a, a feel and um, an aesthetic 
um, in my own sense, you know, rather than just going on a written brief for. Yeah. The the other thing I guess as well is that this this stuff's kind of a vehicle a lot of times is a vehicle for me doing you know, for my own art because unlike the film stuff, the briefs can be quite loose, quite um you know, very very open to you know, vast amount of creative input from me. Yeah, and that I mean obviously in contrast to you know, to, to the day job, um, it'd be quite liberating to be able to have that sort of free reign and people put their trust in you to be able to sort of get, get those thoughts out and, and sort of mold it your way with, you know, with some direction, but obviously not to the, not to the restraints, constraints of, um, of what the film industry would be. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. It's, um, yeah, it's, it's a nice, it's, it's definitely a nice thing to, to experience. Going back a little bit, and with, I guess, illustration and art and, you know, looking at all the work that you do, and there's quite a bit of variance in the types of work that you do, you know, professionally and, well, it's, in my opinion, it's all professional, but I mean, given the separation of your, your day job with everything you're doing outside of that, I mean, what was, what were the early uh, childhood experiences for yourself when it came to art? I mean, did it start off with, uh, you know, the... The, the pencil and paper and doing a bunch of sketches of random things? I mean, what were, what were some of the early sort of stages for you when it came to just kicking off uh, this interest of, you know, art in general? Well, I mean, I think I was always, you know, m my parents always, you know, gave me pencil and paper and paints and things to just muck around with. And Lego was a big thing, I think. Um, I think one of the more, the earliest, more formalised things was probably um, they, they put... Um, put me in a, a an art class, like a, an out of school art class, um, which was more kind of just an experimentation. Um, it was run by um, what's his name, Barry Sharp, I think. Um, he, he was a local artist in, in Tauranga at the time, uh, where I grew up in Bay of Plenty. Um, but he he ran these little workshops uh, for for kids and adults as well, I think. And they were, you know, just just experimenting with all different mediums. And I remember doing. Um, you know, just making pottery and putting glazes on it and firing that and doing, uh, you know, marbling where you put the um, the ink on the water and lay paper down. And so that was probably probably my earliest memory of, you know, of becoming conscious of that kind of art realm. Um, and later on, you know, I just, I was a kid at, you know, intermediate, and I didn't get intermediate, but that age, sort of 12, you know, 11, 12, 13, um, sort of, drawing my math book and that kind of thing. <laughs> um, so, yeah, and I, and I studied I studied painting uh, at high school. Um, and I guess my sort of, you know, I've seen, you know, this before internet, I guess, going to the library and finding these gems of, uh, you know, a fantasy art book, or like a compilation. I remember one that, you know, and I kind of was flipping through it and kind of it was a Frank Frazetta piece that just, arrested me and I was just like, what the hell? This is, you know, people people are doing this. It's, it's amazing. Um, I think I might have been about 10 or 11 at the time, mm. but it definitely had a big, a big impact on me. And, um, yeah, I, I think later on, like high school, towards the end of high school, I was trying to figure out what I'm going to do for work um, or, you know, going on to a tertiary education. And I kind of got a bit disillusioned by it all. You know, I, I just didn't. I didn't really. I, I was kind of looking at a lot of what the the fine art arena was at that time, and it was just really not appealing. I, I didn't really connect with contemporary art or what you know what's most of us associate with sort of contemporary fine art. Um, and the stuff I was interested in was it didn't really have, you know, I couldn't really see a, you know an outlet for that at that time. Um, and I ended up going to. Uh, well, funnily enough, I, I went to uh, my art teacher at school, um, Grant Thompson. He, he he was connected with, um, I think he went to a conference or something, and Richard Taylor of Weta Workshop was was at that conference, and um, and they made that connection, and um, my art teacher jacked up a visit for me, so it was sort of a road trip down to Wellington. And this was before anyone knew who Weta was or, you know, that what's you know the film industry in, in Wellington that's sort of blossomed since then, and I think you know Peter Jackson. Peter Jackson wasn't a household name at the time, but 
when I went down there, they were just in post production of um, the first Lord of the Rings films. This was uh, 2001, mm-hmm. mid 2001. So the film hadn't come out, um, but I, you know, a lot of the the artists and um, technicians and various people working working in that facility were they were busy doing kind of uh, merchandising for the film. So, you know, sculpting these, you know, really accurate figurines, and it was that was quite eye opening. Um, so that kind of I got home and promptly started, you know, trying to make sculptures myself. And yeah. Um, but anyway, it kind of it definitely that was I think that was a seed that was planted, but it all kind of took a back burner, and I ended up going to Auckland Uni and um, doing a civil engineering degree of all things. Oh well. Wow. So um, I, I kind of figured like about two thirds of the way through that, I was like, I don't don't know if I want to pursue this, but I, I finished it anyway. Um, and then I said about you know seeing if this this film work uh, might be a viable option and. Yeah, put, put together a portfolio and yeah, it um, and off you went. I, I, I was a, yeah, that's <laughs> kind of the, the start of yeah. That was about thirteen years ago. So yeah. So, so I mean, apart from you know, I think some of those key things like I'm always trying to find those patterns, like what makes people really good at doing things, and and um, you know, especially when. I mean, at least I'll say it from my my point of view. I mean, you're you're freaking talented. I mean, like you you your level of expertise in in this art is incredible. And but when I'm listening to you sort of explain it, I mean, obviously having the opportunity with, through your parents to be able to do stuff outside of school, develop an interest and in sort of, and I guess a lot of those basic skills of just having patience and focus and just allowing things to take time to build and and to create things would be a massive help. But apart from like studying painting in high school i mean it sounds like for the most part a lot of this has been self-taught with you know a little some additional things here and there but nothing sort of you know terribly formal or from a qualification point of view that sort of landed you where you are it's been sort of a case of this gradual sort of um you know gradual steps um of you just being exposed to different situations and just adding little pieces to your portfolio yeah, for sure. And I mean, I look back on that early, that portfolio stuff and it's kind of cringeworthy, you know, it's like, <laughs> oh God, <laughs> so naive. And I mean, I even look back on stuff I did two weeks ago and I think it's naive, but you know, that I guess that signifies that you're, you're always growing. Um, yeah, I, I mean, the self-taught thing, it, it feels like it has been a slow process, but um, I mean, working in film, that was sort of definitely, you know, having all the people around you um, doing that work as well and being able to bounce off them and have that collaborative process, you definitely accelerate a lot. Um, and doing random things, going to, you know, workshops. And I went to, um, went to Florence, what was that? Seven, well, seven years ago now, just for a summer school, you know, and just the painting, um, painting there and that kind of, you know, the heart of the Renaissance. Mm. That, that had a big influence, I think, when I came back and, subsequent you know illustration work I did and and the film work too um but yeah I mean I don't I don't know if I I, I, the jury's out I guess on um you know whether I believe in inherent talent because I I think it does a lot of it you know I I don't know how you, you feel about it with in regards to music but with the art for me it's it's kind of um I I think it is just perseverance and and uh constant interest you know i think you know there's some people some well you know talented gifted whatever you know people who have a lot of potential and things but they don't they don't have the focus or the the interest to sort of take it to another level um and and, and it's it's weird man because i feel i still feel super clumsy and you know i look at my work and i'm real critical of it um because i guess the more you learn about it um a discipline the your your awareness of how much there is to know is sort of broadens exponentially. Is that if that makes sense? Yeah. Um, so you kind of you never feel like you're. Well, there's moments where you you, you can kind of look back and say, okay, I'm getting better at this thing. Um, but you're never satisfied. You know, it's always like you you know you can do better at the next one. So it's kind of yeah, just got to forge ahead, I guess, and. There's a there's a level, and, level of frustration there, no doubt. Like uh, I I think I understand what you mean as far as, like I think if you, if you start to become 
overly satisfied with what you're doing, then you get complacent, I think. And that's when people sort of their limitations show. And I think it's probably a really healthy thing to always have that underlying, uh, it's not the right word, but I was going to say like an underlying stress there just to say that I, you know, I'm, I'm not as good as what I can be. And there's, there's something more that I can be doing here. And, and it's just enough just to keep you, keep you moving and keep, you know, what you do, no matter what it is um, in life, just to evolve and, and, and just gradually sort of get better and better over time. But I mean, even as you said before about sort of, you know, people being inherited with like, you know, gifted talents and things like that. I think, I think, you know, from a genetic point of view, I think people may have certain tenant behaviors where it might people, you know, levels of focus and patience or calmness, uh, might sort of come through, come through from, from, uh, parents or, or whatnot. But I think, you know, as far as skill and talent, I think it's just, it's a product of environment and those, those really basic sort of qualities of perseverance and hard work and just being around the right things that can stimulate you and, and provide you with guidance along the way. And that's, I think that's what makes people great. And it just comes down to your, your set of circumstances. And some people are more fortunate than others when they, they meet up, bump into people or get exposed to, to little things along the way that sort of steer them in a particular direction. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I've, I've been thinking about this, this a lot in, in relation to, um, like my, my son, uh, he's two years old and we're about to have, um, my wife and I are about to have another child probably, uh, any day now. But, um, oh, congratulations. Four, we four weeks. Four, thanks, man. <laughs> uh, four weeks away on that due date, but, um, yeah, it could be any time. So, but I'm really conscious of, um, you know, giving them as many opportunities, trying out as many and pushing them to try as many different things as, as possible, but uh, trying to, you know, not push too hard, but be aware of where their interests gravitate towards, you know. Um, and I guess as being kids, as I, as I recall myself, you know, you kind of, there's definitely something to be said for your parents pushing you enough for you to, you know, um, go along to as many classes of something where you, you start learning and you kind of have that, um, I don't know, there's something clicks and you're like, oh, wow, okay, this is, you, you find that drive. Whereas if you go one class, you know, you're not necessarily going to like it immediately. So, yeah. That's, that's right. It's always, it's always showing up again after the first, uh, the first visit, which is the hardest. And that's where most people sort of give up and never, never come back. I think I was talking to somebody a while back about, um, about uh, jujitsu and sort of martial arts. And they said like the hardest thing is just coming back you know, that after that first day and the yeah. shock and, and just being pushed and challenged, um, you know, a lot of people just never return. But if you, if you're able to walk through the door on that second occasion, then, you know, that's, that's most of the battle won initially. And mm -hmm. after that, you know, it, there will always be challenges, but mentally you're able to sort of get past those initial things that stop most people. Yeah, totally. It's funny you say that cause I've been doing Brazilian Jiu Jitsu for about four years now. Um, and it's, yeah, it's, it's that struggle totally to, I remember that, that first, that first day walking in and, you know, I had a, a couple of friends who kind of, um, I guess had that sort of moral support of like, all right, let's do this. So the three of us went in and, um, it, it was so humbling just, you know, basically people, you know, they're, they're doing stuff you don't even, you don't even realize, but they just completely manipulate you and you're just at their mercy. <laughs> And it's um, kind of, I remember the, the sensation of feeling like I was drowning. It's, um, but yeah, there was something there that, you know, to come back sort of, it's like, oh, wow, this is, this is amazing. And I want to learn more, you know, I want to do what they're doing. So, um, yeah, that, that, that's another sort of hobby that I definitely find really valuable. Um, learn a lot of life lessons from that. That, and I mean, I've been, I, I keep getting all these signs from people. I think I've, I think I've got to take the plunge and stop being a, a wuss and actually, uh, take up a martial art because every, like there's so many people that are talking about, um, jujitsu and, and a lot of different, you know, mixed martial arts and just learning, learning to just push themselves and challenge themselves. And there's just so many, 
benefits that can come out of it, you know, just from a personal development point of view. But then obviously for people, depending on what their profession is, they become, you know, far more disciplined. Um, their, their, their mindset, the way that they approach everything in life is, is just coming from it, looking through different, a different lens. And, um, and even just to hear you say that, I'm like, oh, there's another person, <laughs> another person who's, who's getting some real, yeah. some real value from it. So it's, it's interesting to, to see where, um, where a lot of these lessons can come from. And, and this seems to be a, a, a more common thing than ever. I'm sure there's, you know, all, all the disciplines that are, you know, difficult and, um, and worth doing, I think they, they do bleed out into other areas of your life and, and make them better, you know. Um, I de definitely, um, since having having our son, and I'm just sort of bracing myself for the second one. But um, it's I've been I've so much more disciplined with how I use utilize my time. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I look back on before having kids and how much time, you know how much I just mucked around and didn't you know it's like wow I had all that spare time and what did I do with it? You know, yeah. <laughs> it's um it, it definitely you know. It's it's hard, but it, it definitely um, it's yeah, it's it's a sacrifice worth making, in my opinion. So yeah, yeah, and I think I think when anyone's sort of pushed in a in a way where you know they're they're forced to have to change their habits due to you know uh, different circumstances, it could be. It could be a child, it could be a, a job, or it could be anything that sort of is throwing a bit of a, it's not the right thing to say, but it's sort of throwing a spanner in the works as far as what your habits were previously versus what they need to be now in order to sort of manage these changes. And um, it's amazing what people are capable of when they're, they are pushed into a direction where the immediate sort of reaction is, I've I've got no choice. So I have to, I have to adjust or there's going to be, there's going to be chaos otherwise. And I think, I think it's a really good thing for people to, to have that. I mean, I've certainly had that, um, in different stages, uh, especially in the last several years where, um, you know, different circumstances have changed where I've just, it's a sink or swim mentality. You know, I've got to, I've got to adjust. I've got to change. And then suddenly, you know, especially from a time point of view, I can completely relate to that because you start looking at your day and, it's like, oh, geez, I've only got an hour in the morning before I've got to commit myself to some task. And so what do I do in that hour? And then suddenly I find myself doing more and getting more done than I ever did before when I actually had more time to work with. So it's, it's, it's really, it's an interesting thing that a lot of people don't appreciate until they are sort of pushed in a direction where they've got that, that feeling where they, they're sort of forced to have to adjust. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, I totally agree with that. <laughs> going uh, going back a little bit, because uh, one thing you, so you mentioned, you were with your second child about to about to come knocking on the door, um, and you're sort of thinking about this a lot more as, as far as you know pushing you know your, your children to obviously wanting to succeed or pushing not the right word but encouraging them. Um, there's a there's a couple of books, and I know if people people that listen to this podcast uh, are probably sick and tired of me crapping on about books but um, or different types of books and recommending them but um, there's there's two books and they might be worth checking out there's one that's called um, talent is overrated and I think it sort of goes into the concept of analyzing a lot of like some of the most famous sort of you know athletes and and people that have um, have just excelled in their own sort of domain and sort of analyzing the concept of whether they've inherited these these tendencies or these skills uh, from birth or what it was it external sort of environment um, sort of influences and what sort of pushed them in that direction. I can't remember who wrote that, but um, it, that's a really good book and it's a good eye, eye opener. Um, the the second one is one called uh, The Talent Code, I think, and I, uh, it's Daniel Somebody. And um, that's another really good one that sort of analyzes what the meaning of talent is and what it actually means and sort of getting into the guts of it and sort of it's a bit of an eye opener. And, um, the other one is one that just keeps showing up over and over again is called, uh, mindset by Carolyn DeWink or something like that. And, um, it talks about fixed and growth mindset. Um, so, you know, with children and it's, it's a funny thing for me to comment on cause I don't have kids. So here's me sort of like talking about <laughs> people raising children, but, um, they talk about how you can, when you're encouraging a child to, um, to do something or you're rewarding them, you're rewarding them on their, their effort rather than their result. Um, you want them to sort of feel happy with the amount of 
effort that they put into a task regardless of whatever the outcome is and if you keep praising them about how smart they are or how you know how many achievements they get or how many trophies they get or whatever it is then at some point in time down the track when they get out into the to the wider world and they start to feel adversity they can't handle it as much because they're used to i guess the praise of the end product the success but not actually the hard work or the determination the discipline and all those things that happen along the way to get to the end point so they find that people seem teen, uh, tend to succeed a lot more when they're encouraged and praised for that what they put into it, the effort, regardless of the outcome. And I thought oh, that's quite interesting because I've certainly sort of reflecting on my own life as you know growing up and even sort of now as an adult, you sort of look at it and go, oh yeah, I you know sometimes I I, I tend to not sort of even praise myself for, you know, the effort that I'm putting into, I'm usually shooting myself like, or shooting myself down for whatever the result was rather than what I learned out of that experience. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I'll have to check those books out. They sound really interesting. Um, yeah. The one I can add to the mix in that regard is um, the, the war of art. Um, if you see that one, I've got uh, right Stephen Pressfield. Me. Yeah. It's amazing. I'm, uh, there you go. <laughs> it's my, it's my daily Bible. So that, that, <laughs> Yeah, I mean the whole the whole um, perspective of just you know turning up, turning up and doing the work. You know, you're not always going to get something amazing out of it, but you know, there's that. Um, I think a lot of people, uh, as again, I don't, I don't know if this is it's probably the same for music, but with um, with with art, it's kind of like you think, fuck, we've got no ideas. Um, uh, you know, what's the point in drawing? You know, drawing something if I don't ever don't have a specific idea, but more often than not, you'll find ideas through the art of, you know, through, you know, through the act of doing it. Mm. Um, and it's with that perseverance of just making it routine and, and doing doing the work. Because um, I think that's, you know, the most, the people with the most interesting ideas are usually, from what I can observe, are the, the most prolific. You know, they've, um, most artists I follow on Instagram or whatever, they who are pumping out a lot of work. You know, not everything's, um, is, resonates with you, but you know there'll be a, there'll be um, like a regular regular pattern of amazing things that will will pop up, and you're just like, holy hell, how did they achieve that? And then you kind of look back and see all this other stuff that this kind of path of creating stuff to get this um, masterpiece or whatever. You know, it's um, it's definitely through the act of doing. You know, you find you find these happy accidents, and well, not necessarily accidents, but this kind of um, the evolution of ideas as they kind of they spring up well it's kind of like that uh, myth of of being an overnight success people go oh wow this person's come out of nowhere and uh you know how do they do it they must be they're so gifted etc cetera, etc cetera. and Been and then grinding away for a, oh, a decade or more <laughs> yeah that's right they're getting no love whatsoever and not being recognized and and probably producing a lot of crap along the way and and but as as you said like through through evolution and sort of growing and and learning and building on it then you you end up getting to those points where more people can uh can see what uh, what those results are but i i certainly have seen that quite a bit and um and that book that the war of art book is absolutely incredible even if you're not a creative you know or you're not doing anything that's sort of creative based i mean the whole fact that he's been able to put a persona around this thing called the resistance is like genius it's just so smart because you're you catch yourself out you catch yourself making some bullshit excuse that you know oh, i'm not going to do that uh, because there's some distracting sort of excuse that i'd rather do something else and you just you come up with so many weird little storylines to to pull yourself away from actually getting on with the task and that book just describes it so well and when i read that for the first time i just thought wow like it's a game changer in the sense that life is incredibly simple it's not easy but it's incredibly simple um and you can do really well and you can have a contribution and you can follow the things that you you know pursue the things that you want to pursue but there's no secret source here it's it's just showing up every day and just just grinding it out and <laughs> and and it works and it's a simple formula but it's just it's just really difficult that's the that's the challenge around it yeah and i mean i, I think um but, you know, people get disheartened as well because they, they fall off the wagon and, you know, and I, I think we all do it though. You know, we all kind of, you know, you'll try, you'll try to keep a routine and do, and, you know, try to chip away and then it'll fall apart and you're like, oh shit, you just have to get back up and, and, and try again, you know. It's, um, it's that, 
stubbornness, I guess, to, <laughs> to keep going. Um, yeah, it's, I, de- I definitely think with my art and, you know, life's obstacles that um, that come along, you, you definitely have, I think these things come in waves as well. Um, I think people give up too easily in a lot of respects. Um, but the, I think the longer, like most of these disciplines, the longer you stick with them, the more resolve you have to keep going. Um, I think my passion for art is, you know, it's as, as high as it's ever been. Um, it's yeah, I, I don't I don't see that diminishing anytime soon for sure. Well, I think especially, I mean, not that not that it's always a healthy thing to be sort of stimulated or inspired by um, outside influences, because I think that's sort of you. A lot of people sort of crash and burn because they're they're relying on. The, the validation of others to sort of fuel them. And when they're not getting anything back, then that's when people give up, as you said, like a lot of, a lot of talented people out there, a lot of people I've met over the years who have just shown these amazing signs of potential and just haven't received the praise or the recognition that they wanted early enough and have just uh, thrown in the towel and I'm just living a life now with, and, I've, and I keep in touch with a few of them where there's just this level of, bitterness or dissatisfaction with just what's going on in their life because they're not they're not doing what they want to do but i think for i mean i'm just assuming for for yourself you know as your art continues to get recognized and your work continues to get recognized that would help in a way um to to keep you fueled in addition to all the discipline and and the drive that you sort of developed over the years yeah i i I definitely think so i think um well, I know I know people in the film industry who focus too much on that. I think they get too emotionally invested, and I've been guilty of this as well. Most people I know who <laughs> in, the, in the industry are, are guilty of this. Um, uh, you know, you get yeah too much emotionally invested in the work you're doing, and it can so easily just be brushed aside. And you know, you you can't you can't approach it that way. You have to just just be able to just just tune it out and just you know have. Um, you know, put all your um, professionalism into it and, and do a great job, but just you have to be cautious of being, you know, giving everything to that because a lot of the work, you know, well, most of the work I, I do in the film industry, it doesn't get seen by the public. You know, there isn't that external validation of what you're what you're creating. Um, the stuff that does get out there, you know, that's just a very small percentage, um, whether it's in art books or, you know, the ra- random pieces that you can share online. It's, um, yeah, it, I, I definitely was in a kind of a rough space back in, about, yeah, 2010 when I actually started doing album art, when I did that first Beast Wars painting, which is kind of half the reason why I jumped at the, the opportunity. Um I was, I was kind of, I was, well, we were kind of part way through doing working on the Hobbit, and it was, um, you know, I just wasn't, ha- I wasn't in the right headspace, and I think that was part of the problem. Was yeah, I just didn't have that, um, didn't have that external validation that I think, you know, you don't want to fall into the trap of that being, you know, you're focusing on that because I think most people were, you know, have a creative outlet. It's the act of doing it and creating. Um, is where the satisfaction comes, but you do want to be able to share stuff with people. So uh, whenever I, you know, run into people in the industry who um, are pretty jaded and pretty, you know, burnt out, I, I always just say, well, are you doing your own work? You know, are you, are you carving out time to, to make your own stuff and putting it out there? And usually the answer is no, you know, so, <laughs> um, so def- definitely from my own experience, that's, it's important to do that. Sort of looking at your art, from that's almost 10 years ago now uh, do you find that it's you're quite critical of it do you even though you've highlighted it as part of your portfolio and and it's out there for people to see do you do you sort of look back at it and and sort of cringe and think oh i could have done that better or there's certain aspects of it that you wouldn't do now um there's certainly is, there, there's definitely that stuff that i couldn't see before um you know obviously technical stuff is always improving but um from a conceptual standpoint, um, you know, there, there's some naive stuff, but I also think, you know, you'd, I think some of the early work as well, I, I think I made bold choices that I might not necessarily do now. You know, it's kind of, 
I, I kind of look at a lot of that stuff as that's a slice of time, you know, that's, that is what it is. Um, it was really funny. I went, I went, um, I went to the Frank Pizzetta Museum um, when it was over on the um, east coast of the States a few years ago. And there was a, there was one, a smaller painting of, um, you're familiar with the, you know, the death dealer. It's one of his yeah. kind of recurring characters. Um, the guy, the, you know, the, the axe and the, the shadowed helmet, uh, horned helmet. Um, and there was this painting, and then beside it was a, a different version of the same painting, and it was a print of what was underneath. So he had done this, he had done this painting years and years before, and um, and obviously he had come back to it and decided he didn't like it and painted over the top of it. So the only thing, you know, there's images of the what it used to be existing, but the you know that painting's gone, and um, it's definitely there's there's a I've definitely felt with my own work, like, you know, I'll be looking at a piece like, oh, you know, like there's definitely a, um, something there that's like, oh, maybe if I just, you know, I could change this and change that. But I kind of, I'm, I'm really reluctant to do that. And I, I think you just need to move forward. You know, it's, um, I think it's important to look at those things, see the mistakes or see the things that you do differently and, and leave it, you know, have, be it, let it be a reminder of like, okay, that's where I was at that point in time as you said, like sort of this almost time capsule sort of thing, just a, a stamp of, of what was happening at that point in time is probably a really, a real positive way of looking at it because it's sort of like, regardless of, you know, what it is and, and the quality of it or whether you're happy with it or not, it's, it, it is what it is at that time and you sort of let go of it. And I think that's, you know, from a psychological point of view and anything in life, I mean, you know, a lot of people unfortunately live in the past and they, they go over old old pain points and things that they're not happy with. And, and as a result, they, they, they're not looking ahead and they're, they're not taking advantage of whatever's happening in the current moment or what's happening in the future. So it's, um, it, it's cool to sort of hear you say that because it's sort of a way of just acknowledging that, um, you know, it, it is what it is and, and it can exist in its own sort of space and, and that's it. And we, we move on. Yeah. And I think kind of linked up with that as well. It's, um, the whole concept of deadlines for to getting work done, you know, you think, shit, I wish I had more time to do this. Um, but you just have to crank it out and get it done, get it done in an efficient way, you know. Um, and I think, you know, like the, the album art stuff, you know, having, having deadlines is actually can be quite helpful because in terms of productivity, mm. you know, you if it, if it was just my own piece of art that I was, you know, I was trying to do this big elaborate piece and, you know, you can always put you put it off. You know, it's like, oh, you know, I'm not right feeling it this today, this week, whatever. I'll come back to it, and you noodle away at stuff. And you know, you have this conception maybe that it's you just want to keep dialing it and dialing it and getting it perfect, but that perfection doesn't really exist. So, actually, letting go of stuff faster. You know, just just getting it done out there. Learn from all the mistakes or the you know the things you've learned, the positive things, the negative things from that particular project get on to the next one you know so sort of that whole was a fa um, fail hard fail fast sort of mentality yeah. i think that can be quite useful i uh, definitely and I, I would assume that um there would, there would come a point in time which is hard to sort of work out where that line is where you you sort of you're not doing something from the heart so to speak versus something becoming too clinical and too analytical um you know when you start to get to that point where you're, you're desperately searching for perfection. That's when you sort of lost that, the whole inspiration to begin with the energy that sort of inspired the piece to begin with. And you sort of, you start to sort of you run on, run on fumes. You've only got a little bit left. And I guess that's when people sort of overstep it and, and probably lose the essence of what was, what it was all meant to be in the, in the first place. Totally. Um, well, oh, man, I, I couldn't. I couldn't count the time, number of times like I've had a little sketch I've drawn, and there's something really compelling about it. You know, maybe a, a, a sketch picked out from ten, um, where I'm just maybe playing with composition or whatever, just in that those initial conceptual phases of a uh, of a piece. And um, I'll go, well, right, okay, there's something here. I can, you know, start working on this. And you start, you know, dial it in. You know, you get get the forms better, get the, maybe it's a figurative thing, the anatomy down, and it all starts to tighten up. And weirdly, often it, it loses all its energy. There's, there's something in that that initial um, creation that had 
you know, it's a, there's a looseness. That, it's something I'm, you know, I, I definitely notice in my own work that I always try and, you know, pull a piece back to that initial sketch. I always keep keep referencing back to it. Don't don't let that be lost in the process. Um, I don't know what that is. It's um, there's something maybe something more genuine, something more um, pure in it. I don't know, but but, but it does. I think you mentioned you know the, the word you mentioned the word sterile or something, and it, it just that clicked. It's like yes, it becomes you know there, there's there's something clinical and and um, I don't know um, detached when when you when you almost take things too far and and remove it from that. Yeah. That early concept. Yeah. Do you find yourself like maybe sort of in those early stages as you as you're putting together? I'm sure it's different for every piece that you work on. But do you do you ever experience that sort of flow state where you sort of not not so much just lose track of time, but you sort of almost it's very woo woo. Sounds ridiculous. And it's totally not my my uh, my domain. But you sort of almost feel like you're ch- channeling something that essence that comes through where you're sort of you just it's just happening in front of you as you're going you're, you're almost detached in a healthy way like you you're but you're almost channeling whatever this inspiration is yeah i've definitely felt that um i don't know i don't know rightly intellectually what to make of it yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I definitely i definitely know what you're talking about um i and I th- a thing later on, you know, when you when I'm actually in the process of doing working on a big piece um, and and just going through the process of painting, um, it definitely puts me in a kind of an altered state. I'm not quite. I don't know how otherwise to term that because I'm still, you know, um, I'm, I'm still in a, in a normal. You know, someone can come into the room and talk to me, and I'll turn around and have a conversation with them. It's not, you know, you're not you're not disappearing into another place, but you're definitely. I don't know. The, you definitely go somewhere. That's um, the only way I can term it. It's kind of it can be like an altered state of consciousness, and you know, music. I mean, listening to music while I work is um, that takes me to some interesting places. You know, um, I've, yeah, definitely been on some weird, weird mental journeys while working on working on a painting. You know, and listening to music, and yeah, that's. Um, like, right, okay, what am I going to listen to next? Where is this going to go? <laughs> it's kind of funny. Oh. But, I mean, music's always been a, a big aspect of... It's been quite synergistic um, with how I work when I'm, you know, creating art. I can only imagine what your playlist would look like, um, given given the art that you're, that you're churning out uh, over the last few years. Yeah. It's, um, it must There must be a, a slightly darker and harder edge to it, and given the bands that you work with as well, I'm, I'm sure that they, they sit in yeah. the playlist as well. It's it's pretty eclectic too. It, yeah. it jumps around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I'm just thinking of some weird, weird mind spaces of listening to Tom Waits while I'm painting. You know, he he paints a very um, he paints a lyrical uh, painting. You know, and it's just the way the way he writes lyrics and sings. And you know, he, well, if you can call that singing, but it um, conjures very visual worlds for me. You know, he's um, he's an interesting character. That's definitely um, that's definitely somebody that I have only had a little bit of exposure to. I think I've got Blood Money, and yep. really enjoy it. And it was always one of those artists where I thought, "Yep, um, I reckon I'm going to really enjoy uh, you know the whole discography and, and and dig into it." And then I just never got there. <laughs> so, but it's cool yeah. because it, that I can I can understand how that could make sense and sort of add to creating some form of. Oh, I don't know what what the word would be. Some form of atmosphere around sort of what you're doing and potentially sort of help sort of create a little bit of a soundtrack and ambience to 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 what you're doing in that in that moment in time. Yeah, yeah, that guy's quite. He, he's quite um, polarizing. I find like people either love him or hate him. <laughs> I listen to a lot of eclectic stuff. It's, um, yeah, I mean, I, I do listen to a lot of metal, and I mean, there's so many different avenues it's sort of I mean I find you know you go on go on the internet go on YouTube or go on Bandcamp or something and you can go down some rabbit holes and it's all I don't know about you but I I find it almost overwhelming you know it's like so much good music here it's just where do you start you know it's like um, yeah I I definitely you know people kind of romanticize you know the 
bygone eras of music, you know, the, the 60s and, you know, all that. Well, that's when people were being really creative and that's where a lot of these, you know, genres we now know were birthed. And I don't know, I don't know man, because I, I listen to a lot of new music and it's just as invigorating, you know, and people could say, oh, well, they're just rehashing what's been done before, but I don't know. It's, you know, you, you've only got a set number of ingredients to put into this, you know, into this creation and I don't know I, it's still, people still find ways of creating something new and fresh I think I well you know or just people people connect with it at different times of their lives and it, it reverberates with them and in, in an interesting way and they're like wow this is um yeah I mean a lot of music for me it, it, it takes me back to certain periods in my life you know and and you know some stuff I might not listen to very often anymore but as soon as I you know you know, dredge it up after ten years and have a listen and say, Holy hell, it takes you takes you right back to where you were at that time and yeah. Yeah, music's a crazy thing. I think um I think I think music's just the same as any other form of art. I think they're you know, I'm sure in, in your domain with what you do, you know, people can easily sort of throw those same things around saying, you know, nothing, nothing's original anymore or everything's a rehash or, or a variation of something that's already been done. And yeah, that's, that, I guess that's right to, to a degree, but, um, you know, everyone's got a really defined, unique set of circumstances being a product of their environment and different experiences throughout, you know, that person's life. And that comes through with whatever they decide to put out there into the world. And so there's just, even if something, on paper looks almost identical to something else um, from a musical point of view, at least um, there will be a nuance to it or something that's slightly different. That'll put a slightly different shade on something that gives a whole different sort of vibe or, or message or whatever it is to it. And um, I mean, I, I agree with what you're saying. I mean, it's now, I think that with, I think with just with technology and the way that we can sort of connect with each other a lot easier than ever before and share things. And I think it's cheaper to be able to, create art whatever that is and share it with people um i think it's just a it's a really interesting and exciting time because you've just got so many people now that have the ability to to not be held back and can express themselves in these really amazing ways and if anything it's probably more unique now than ever before just because of the environment that we're living in and so I, I can't keep up with everything. I mean, I'm still discovering music from the seventies, you know, uh, now, and I'm, I'm decades behind, but at the same time, we've got, you know, you look at the 2019 releases from all these different sub genres of metal and rock and, you know, all these different things in between and, uh, weird combined sort of mongrel genres that have been created. And you sort of look at them and go, wow, like there's so much to listen to. And, um, once again, where's where's the time in the day? I've gonna to have to actually time block some uh, some music listening time just to stay up to date with what's going on. Yeah, it's definitely um, it can be overwhelming, but it's also quite invigorating. I think just like you say, there's there's never really been a better time to be a creative person. So many so many avenues you can take to monetize stuff and and make it um, you know a viable thing. Um, yeah, it's. I mean, you know, I I would love in the future to be able to spend more time doing my own art. Um, but you know, right now the the film works. I enjoy the job. It's paying the bills, and you know, um, it'll be nice to sort of, you know, gradually, you know, change to more, you know, a slant of doing more sort of fine art stuff. But yeah, I think that's a lot. I mean, most musicians I know, most visual artists sort of have a have a job I mean if you know if they're lucky it's a job in the field you know sort of in the vicinity of, of what they really want to be doing um, but yeah they still still have to do that pay, pay the bills and, and do that day job and 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 the creative stuff comes as a, as a passion that they they do on the side um, I you know you no know, independent artists and I mean the, the funny thing is like I I've got you know you meet some of your heroes who are um, you think, oh well, wow, you know, they must have it sorted out now. They they'd be just doing their own stuff all the time. They don't have to do, you know, these um, these other jobs. But it's amazing how many of them still still struggle, you know, and ha have to, you know, they'll, they'll still do all these, you know, the, I guess industry work for for lack of a better word. Um, 
but I think the the successful ones for sure are the ones who just keep cranking on with their own stuff and they they become you know their their style people seek them out for their style um even within the the industry work so you know i'm I'm, I'm thinking of Tony like uh, John Howe who's sort of that guy's been um he was a you know lead creative along with Alan Lee on Lord of the Rings and the Hobbit um putting the you know creating the visual language for those worlds um they've been those guys have been doing illustrating Tolkien's world for you know since before I was born so <laughs> it's it's pretty wild um and they're still doing it you know so it's but they they their their works become synonymous with that universe and um yeah it's just interesting to observe that kind of thing it's good to see um i mean it sort of goes back into a lot of the stuff we we're saying earlier around um you know really sort of having that discipline in place just to keep showing up and just keep keep putting in the hard work and i think when when you can find the the appreciation of of that and understand its value in that then it doesn't matter how long it takes because it just becomes a part of your life, you know? And I think, I think, I mean, I, I always try to look at things, you know, glass half full sort of perspective. And, and even for a lot of us, I mean, I'm in the same boat. You, you have sort of a primary sort of source of, of income. And then, and then you have, uh, you know, one, at least one, or for some people, a shit ton of passion projects that sort of rotate around, around that mainstream of uh, money coming in and, and you sort of just try and balance it and make it all work. But I think now with, you know, with the internet and with being able to share ideas and record or, you know, document or illustrate or be able to express yourself in, in all these different ways and it's easier and cheaper and there's less gatekeepers there as well that it probably takes the edge off the mundane aspects of life where people have the traditional nine to five job or whatever it might be. And they can, they can bear it because they know that there's more balance in life now where they've got the opportunities not being suppressed outside of work, where they can't do the things that they love to do because the job brings them down, the man's holding them back, you know? So it's, it's kind of, it's kind of cool in a way. Cause I think there's a lot of people out there that are really sort of totally comfortable with just having that balance and just enjoying it for what it is. And, and I think other people have also got the patience in place where they go, I'm not, I'm not panicking. I'm not in a rush and my time will come, whatever that means, uh, you know, whatever, whatever success means to, to me as an individual, that, that will come in time as long as I just keep showing up and just, just doing what I need to do today in the moment and just getting it done and enjoying each step along the way, enjoying that journey, so to speak. Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, I was, I was just talking to my wife actually the other night about this, but, um, in recent times, you know, if I've had stressful times at work and come home and, you know, I, I hung up on, you know, that external crap that's not really important and it pulls you out of the moment where, you you know, I, I should be, you know, being there in the moment with my wife, with my son. And um, I've definitely caught myself doing that. And it's, you know, you, you, if you can recognize that, then you can strive to try and not do that in the future, you know, because... That really, that moment that really is all there is. You know, you, you're not doing yourself any favors by angsting over, you know, those sort of things. That you, there's no, you know, you're not doing anything positive for that problem in that moment. Um, it's just something for later on. So, or so, you know, or dwelling on things from the past. It's um, it's not, it's not a useful, um, it's not a useful thing. No, yeah, it just, I mean, it's a. Uh it's completely draining and it's just a, it's a waste of, it's a waste of energy, but it's something that, um, you know, I think almost every person struggles with because we're, we're just in some ways hardwired to, to react to a lot of external situations and, and get swept up in, in drama or, or things that ultimately have no, no direct bearing on our lives or, you know, what, what we're doing or the control that we actually have over ourselves. And it's, um, it's a big thing. And as you start to get the self-awareness to sort of see, see that, that potential separation that can be there where you can detach and think this is not my, that's, that's outside of my, my circle of, of control. Um, it's amazing to see how many other people out there do struggle with this kind of stuff. Um, you know, I've, 
I've certainly gone through that um, quite a bit over the years. And as you start to learn more about yourself and your own limitations, then you, you sort of look back and go, oh, wow, like, I can't believe like, like all, most of the problems I've had in life have, have come from me, um, you know, putting energy into things that have got nothing to do with me or, or, um, you know, I've, I've um, allowed external events to, to shape my behaviors and my actions. And it's, um, it's a big eye opener. Just let, you know, trying to let go of the things that, um, and things that you have no control over and just focus on the things that you can control and that you can influence. You know, it's, as you say, it's kind of it's something you, you have to battle against really because of those negative thoughts do flood in and you have to kind of, yeah, try and try and frame it positively. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to wrap it up now because I'm keeping an eye on the time and I, I've I had a bunch of really, really dumb questions to ask you about oil painting, but um, I've got a feeling that I'm going to be coming over to um, New Zealand at some stage in the near future. So if I swing by Wellington and you're around and you've got a little bit of time in your busy schedule, I might uh, try and catch up with you and, uh, and potentially ask you a bunch of dumb questions if you can handle it. Yeah, for sure, man. That'd be great. Yeah. I've, I've really enjoyed this day. It's, um, it's sort of a bit of a novelty for me, but... Um, yeah, thanks. Thanks for the opportunity. It's um, it's not I always. It's always nice to share. Um, you know, just just ramble on and talk about stuff like that, and talk about your passions. So yeah, thanks. Thanks again for the opportunity, Andy. All right, so if you want to go and check out Nick's art, go to nickkellerart.com. He's also on the socials, and I will have all the links in the show notes over at andysocial.net. Um, and also, if you're listening through a mobile device or a podcast player, you should be able to click through or swipe up, and there'll be a bunch of clickable links in there as well. Make sure you follow him. And uh, like any guest that's been on the podcast to date, please uh, reach out to him and let him know what you thought of the chat and, of course, his work. Um, incredibly, incredibly talented guy. Um, I know I'm gushing. I know I'm crapping on, but just, uh, so impressed, like just, and it's, this is what makes this podcast so much fun is to be able to have the opportunity to, to talk with people like Nick, uh, just a really, really cool guy. So, uh, go and check all that out. Nick Keller art. Absolutely fantastic. Few updates from the band tomorrow. If you're listening to this on time tomorrow, or maybe today, maybe people listen to it the next day, or maybe five years later, who knows? Anyway, whatever the date of this episode coming out is the 4th of July, Thursday night, the 4th of July, and tomorrow, Friday, the 5th of July, we will be in Melbourne playing at the Evelyn Hotel uh, for the Forge Heavy Metal Nightclub, which we're headlining. And then on Saturday, the 6th of July, we'll be at Jive Nightclub in Adelaide. Uh, and then the 26th of July, we're at Crowbar in Sydney for the first ever Forge Heavy Metal Nightclub Sydney edition. So if you love metal and you're in Sydney, definitely get out and support that. Sydney freaking needs it so make sure you get out even if it's not for us you don't care about us just get out and support metal we need more events like this and we need to sort of really rejuvenate uh the metal scene in sydney because we need more bands we need more fans out there um you know we're one of the biggest cities in the country and well fucking I, whatever anyway oh, i could just get on a rant about sydney but uh definitely do that crowbar have been absolutely fantastic with injecting a bit of life into the sydney music scene this year um and across all genres and i think us metal fans need to get out and not only support crowbar but just support our own little scene here in sydney and keep it uh building so that's 26th of july at crowbar in sydney for the first ever forge heavy metal nightclub now, uh, the new album, Fallen Idols, is coming out on the 1st of August, and you can pre-order right now by going to lord.net.au slash fi. Uh, thank you so much to everybody that has pre-ordered so far. And uh, if you are going to come to any of these last few shows, you can collect your CD, your pre-order, from the shows if you let us know in advance and you show proof of purchase, and we will give you your CD before the release date. We won't be able to give you anything else, so if you've pre-ordered any of the additional items, they will be posted out separately, but the CD will be available. So if you want to get it early, uh, pre-order it, let us know, and then you can collect it from the show. We may sell some at the show, but they'll be a little bit more expensive, and very limited in supplies. So if you want to hold out and try and buy a CD at the show, just be prepared that you may have to pay a little bit more, and or you may just miss out. So forewarning right there. Um, thank you to everybody that came out to the Canberra, Brisbane, and Perth shows. I have no idea how they went because I'm recording this in advance, but I'm assuming that they were freaking fantastic. So thank you so much to everyone that came out, supported us uh, by attending, 
and also picking up some merch as well. And hopefully everybody that has a copy of the album so far is really, really enjoying it. Make sure you encourage your mates to go and pre-order it by going to lord.net.au slash fi. Um, also, just with regards to the pre-orders, there's three options. Option one is the CD on its own, which you can elect to have it signed if you want. Uh, option two is the CD and the t-shirt. And option three is the deluxe bundle pack, which is the CD, the t-shirt, three patches, which includes a, a back patch. Um, and a bonus CD, which is um, a CD that comprises of karaoke versions of the entire album, plus additional bonus tracks as well. And that's limited to 100 copies. So once they're gone, they're gone, folks. And uh, we've already had a good take up of that third option already. So don't know how many there's going to be by the time this comes out, but definitely go over to lord.net.au slash fi and have a squeeze to see if they're still available. The CD that's available for pre-order, the, the Australian edition of Fallen Idols, has three bonus tracks. There's an additional studio track called In Dreams. And there are two covers. One is John Farns Break the Ice, and the other one is Ice Houses Touch the Fire. And once this first pressing of the album sells out, more than likely we will revert back to a standard worldwide track listing, which will more than likely be the 10 basic, well, basic, oh, our music's so basic, and the 10 standard uh, studio tracks from the album, maybe a separate bonus track, um, which is existing off uh, the current releases. Don't know. I haven't, we haven't made that decision yet, but more than likely the edition that's out now for pre-order and available um, at the shows will more than likely uh, not be repressed again. I think that's a nice way of just uh, saying thank you to everybody that is supporting us with a pre-order uh, purchase and uh, buying from the shows as well. So by the time this tour is over and pre-orders are done and the 1st of August rolls around, uh, more than likely we'll be sold out of that first pressing and we'll be pressing the second edition of the album with a different track listing. So get in if you're a little bit of a collector and you want those bonus tracks. And by the way, if you're a streamer and you love Spotify and Apple Music, which I am too, I've got a premium account on Spotify, but if you're somebody that prefers uh, streaming services, just a heads up that only the the standard 10 tracks from the album will be available on things such as Apple Music and Spotify. The bonus tracks will not be available. So you can get the bonus tracks by um, grabbing them digitally from our Bandcamp page, or you can get them via ordering the CD as well. So um, we want to try and keep things as exclusive as possible to our online store, but also to the people that spend their money and um, support us directly as well. And uh, we do appreciate all the streaming support because that does actually help us significantly. Um, but obviously we want to keep all of our inner circle uh, looked after and uh, support them with as much extra exclusive content as possible. So heads up there, folks. Lord.net.au slash fi. Uh, Self Starter Season 2 is out right now. If you know anybody that loves a bit of, little, <laughs> loves a little bit of small business, that's a great way of putting it. Uh, anybody that's into small business self-employment and or freelancing, uh, direct them to sellstarter.com.au or search for Self Starter in your podcast player. It's a great way to uh, get a little bit of inspiration or reassurance or whatever it might be when it comes to being in the self-employment world, uh, getting started or taking action on an idea and uh, taking the initiative to be a self-starter. So go and check all that out. Season two is out right now. We're a few episodes in and a great response to date. So thank you so much to everybody. Lots of episodes coming and season two will run until the end of this year. So lots of great stories to come. And thank you once again for all the support. Uh, podcast series. I did a 11 part video podcast series, which you can find on YouTube and Facebook. Um, you can search my name or you can search for get into podcasting 11 part series. Each video is on average about two minutes each and, uh, just little bite-sized chunks of information. It is the basics when it comes to podcasting. So if you have been thinking about starting your own your own podcast, you like the idea of it, you've got a cool idea, you've got some stories to tell, you've got some insights, some information to share, or you want to be funny, a bit of entertainment, whatever it is, and you want to get into it, give these videos a shot because hopefully it will give you just a little bit of a kickstart to hopefully give you some confidence and some motivation to take action and uh, create your own. And I'm really, really pumped to get as many people to create their own podcast and get started as possible. The more people out there doing it, the better for all of us. So uh, definitely go and check that out. You can search for my name on YouTube and you'll find my channel or you can search for get into podcasting and there'll be a playlist there and uh, 11 videos in total. And you can also go to my Andy social uh, Facebook page in the video section and all the videos have been uploaded there as well. Oh, they're also on LinkedIn as well. If I, I don't know, some people might be into LinkedIn. 
um, they're uh, they're over there. So go and check it out. Anyway, uh, that's enough. Um, mailing list. Um, hopefully there's been a mailing out by now. If not, kick me up the ass, please. But you can go and sign up to my mailing list by going to andydowling.net or andysocial.net. There's a little pop-up screen there. Enter your email address in. You'll get a welcome email from me which includes a PDF download, which is detailed notes from my podcast video series, but also some additional content as well. It's a little introduction into my world, who I am. I say, how you going, blah, blah, blah. And uh, you can keep that for yourself, you know, very exciting stuff. And what I'll be doing is sending out monthly little newsletters, little recaps of the month that was from every, everything to do with my world, podcasting, band, and otherwise um, will be there. So hopefully there would have been at least one mail out by now. If not, kick me up the ass, please. And that is enough from me. Thank you so much, folks. Lots and lots of episodes coming. Appreciate the support. Keep spreading the word. Pass these episodes around. And until next week, folks, ta-ta. Ta-ta.